Okay, guys, the name of this sermon is going to be Sucks to be you. <laughs> Sucks to be you. Many times you've probably heard sermons where people talk about going through a hard time. You may have heard sermons where people talk about going through a hard time, and some of the people that see you going through a rough time, who you would think would be there to, to, to kind of help you out, to kind of let you know it's going to be all right, sometimes those very people may be the folks that are kind of like in the background watching you go through what you go through, and they're kind of like enjoying it a little bit, like secretly enjoying it, and maybe those very people that sh uh, people that should be there for you are sometimes the people that may have contributed to the rough time that you're going through while they sit there and, and watch you go through it and laugh and chuckle and kind of snicker amongst each other. You may have heard those type of sermons before, and I've done those, but this one right here takes it a little bit further. What happens when you're going through a rough time and you got people who should really be there, but they're kind of like, you know, enjoying it, enjoying seeing what you go through and enjoy seeing you squirm and they kind of contribute to it a little bit. But then all of a sudden, when they least expect it, you start doing better and you start to come out of the depression. You start to come out of, of the anger or the hurt or the resentment. You start to come out of that dark space and you get back into the light and, and, and you're starting to get better. But in the process of you coming out of the mess, the tables turn and the people who were watching you struggling and should have been there for you, but instead they were watching and contributed a little bit to your sorrows. All of a sudden now, now they're going through the rough patch. Now, they're going through the hard time. It's a total role reversal. As you come out of the mess, the tables turn, and now they're starting to have to see a little bit of how you felt. Maybe now the shoe is on the other foot. So the question is, what do you do? How do you go about that? And the answer in this simple sermon, very simple message, simply put is, do not have a sucks to be you attitude in other words be an adult about it don't be this uh you know don't have this nanny boo boo <laughs> type of attitude you know how kids are nanny boo boo nanny boo boo you know <laughs> don't be like that okay don't be immature and i'm talking about not being a kid and i'm wearing a, a, a cartoon t-shirt but just don't 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 look at me <laughs> Listen to me. Don't look at me. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just being funny. But seriously, though, don't have that. Uh, th that's what you get attitude. Don't have that uh, sucks to be you attitude. Don't have this attitude of where when you see those people that were enjoying seeing you go through what you went through, when you see them, you know, don't don't act a certain way and be a, oh, well, it's y'all's fault. You got what's coming to you. It must suck to be y'all right now. Remember, you know, don't do it. In other words, be a Christian about it. Yeah, they're going through what they're going through. And there may really only be so much you can do to help them because, you know, I mean, they kind of, you know, they kind of brought it on themselves. Yeah, they, they probably did. But what I'm saying is don't throw it all in their face. Don't be rude about it. Let them go through their process and just, just, just pray for them. You know, the word lets us know even to pray for our enemies, just, just be good anyway. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to let them, you know, suck you back into some mess again. That's, that's not it. But you can still, well, you should still be Christ-like towards them. So, real quick, look at, <laughs> look at Revelations chapter 12. I'm going to show you something that, you know, to me was, was kind of funny. But Revelations chapter 12, starting at verse 7, it says this, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels. 
and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, <laughs> which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Let me just say this, this real quick before I start to make my point. You notice how in the Bible, as time goes by, we keep giving worse and worse uh, names to the devil. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Like, like, okay, at first, he starts out as Lucifer, because, of course, you know, he's an angel in heaven at first. So he's Lucifer, and Lucifer is, is kind of this pretty name, right? And it has a nice meaning. It means light bearer, right? So, okay, you know, Lucifer. But then, of course... <laughs> As we see here in what I just read, you know, he rebelled against God. There's this war in heaven, blah, 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 blah. So when he falls from heaven and he's this demonic force now that is, is uh, against all humanity, it's like we give him these bad names and they just get progressively worse and worse throughout the Bible. Like at first he's like, he's just the, the serpent, right? You know, he's the serpent that tempts Eve in the Adam and Eve story. So he's the serpent or like a snake, right? So that already sounds bad, calling somebody that was once an angel a snake. That's already kind of kind of harsh. And then we start calling him the devil. And that sounds evil because if, well, you think about it, all you got to do is take the letter D and put it in front of evil and you got devil. So, you know, it makes us sound even more evil. And then we call him Satan. <laughs> That just sounds evil, Satan. <laughs> Not Satan, Satan. <laughs> Not the material, but, but Satan. And then, here comes Revelations. We call him the dragon. <laughs> the great dragon. So it just, man, I'm just telling you, over time, man, we just, we just, it, the writers of the Bible, they were just talking trash to him. I mean, they just gave him worse and worse nicknames i mean we just wanted him to know how terrible he was by what we called him boy <laughs> it just got worse and worse i just I, I thought that was kind of funny i never really thought about it that way up until now when i read this getting ready for this sermon and i was like man we we just want him to know he sucks <laughs> but anyway so but anyway in these scriptures <laughs> in these scriptures we see uh how it plays out you know, the war in heaven, which I'll touch on this a little bit more in, in the next sermon, because I already know what that one's going to be out be about. That one's going to be pretty a pretty fun little message, too. But um, we see how he causes this rebellious war to play out. And, of course, um, he, he's, he's up against God, and uh, he's trying to take the place of God, really, because he wants his worship. Basically, his ego just got to him. And a third of the other angels side with him. And, of course, that leaves the other two-thirds of angels in heaven taking the side of the Lord. And so this awesome angel named Michael, uh, they, they all uh, gather up and they come up against uh, who we now know as Satan and, and the, the angels that choose to be on his side. And there's this war. And, of course, Satan or Lucifer and his uh, angels that take his side, they all fall from heaven. And they are cast down into the earth. And so when you think about it, it sucks for us here on earth. But of course, in heaven, this is a good thing because when you read in the Bible, especially here in, in, in uh, areas of the book of Revelations, you see that heaven is this supposed to be this perfect place. It's a place of no no sorrows, no fears, no tears, no pains, no disease. And it's supposed to be this beautiful, beautiful place of all these different jewels and colors. And it's just a place of just perfectness where, you know, we can be in God's presence 24 seven. It's just, it's just awesome the way it's talked about. So here it is, this awesome place. And then you have Lucifer that starts all this trouble. And then him and all those that want to take his side, they're removed from this place. So you got to know that those that are left, they're, they're happy about this, right? So now skip to verse 12. Look at verse 12. This is like the key verse for this sermon. The writer says this, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. 
Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Now, when it says woe, the word woe, W-O-E, woe, is more of like an expression word. In other words, it's one that it really doesn't so much have a meaning itself. It's just a word that's used to have some type of expression. So, for example, we use the word wow a lot, W-O-W, wow. And that word really doesn't necessarily mean something in itself. It's a word that we use to express how we're feeling on the inside. So if we see or hear something that's amazing, that's blowing our minds, we go, wow, right? So when you hear someone say, wow, it's not really that they're telling you something. It's just, you know, when you hear it, you know that that person is experiencing something that they think is just amazing. Or in some cases, if, if they hear somebody say something they think is stupid, they'll just go, wow. <laughs> but you get my point. They're, they're showing some type of amazement whether they think something is awesome or whether they just think something is stupid they're saying wow <laughs> so there's that or when someone says ouch they're not really you know ouch isn't really saying something really it's just a way of expressing hurt you know you accidentally step on something sharp you go ouch and then that lets people around you know you just hurt yourself so whoa is one of those types of words in the bible and it's basically an exclamation of grief of sorrow so when someone says whoa it's just showing like a grief of sadness and then usually they go on to, to talk about what it is that's supposed to be so sad or so uh, uh, griefful going on and so what what the writer is saying he says whoa to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea for the devil has come down unto you so it's like the writer is saying you know this is going to be bad for you guys. This is something y'all ain't used to down there on earth. We could handle this because cause we, we knew about this, this, this uh, fellow Lucifer. And we knew how to combat him. Because, well, he was one of us until he turned his back on us. But he was one of us. So we, can, we could handle it. But y'all y'all might not be sure how to handle this. This is kind of different for y'all. So you know woe to you guys this is bad this is this is causing some grief this is going to bring y'all some sorrow having him down there but what's funny is this and i've read this before but many times <laughs> many times when i'm reading scripture and I, I i know that something is about to be a sermon that i need to uh, minister is a lot of times what will happen is i'll be reading something and it's like a verse or something that I've read kind of jumps off at the page at me and it's like I can't quite move on from it so I have to kind of wait and, and read it and reread it and kind of meditate on it to get what it is that I feel like God's given me to share for the message and sometimes the way it plays out is I'll read something and it's almost like I'll see it kind of like in a different light from I normally would. Not that I don't get what it's saying, but it's like it'll play out suddenly in my mind in a way that's like really kind of animated or sometimes kind of funny, I guess, because I'm kind of a goofy person. But it'll kind of play out in kind of like a goofy kind of way. So like when I, <laughs> when I read this verse, verse 12, it was like I wasn't playing this out in my head from – the perspective of the writer, the human saying this, it was as if I'm seeing an angel say this and he's saying it right there in, in heaven to all the other angels. And it's almost like this, like the part, the first part where he's saying, you know, rejoice ye heavens. It's like he's saying, all right, y'all up here in heaven, Satan's gone. He's out of here. It's party time. Let's rejoice. Let's celebrate. This is going to be fun. But then when he says, woe to the inhabitants of earth, it's like he's saying, man, y'all down there in heaven or y'all down there in earth, it's going to suck to be y'all. Sorry, we can't help you. We up here partying now. So all of a sudden, it's the 70s in heaven right now. Of course, in heaven, they're not bound by time like we are. So they can just do whatever. They can be in whatever decade they want. So all of a sudden, it's, it's the 70s, and they got all these lights shining down, and, they, and then this disco ball comes down, <laughs> and they're doing all the old dance moves like, 
And then they got this, this move right here. They're, they're getting down. The angels, they're dancing. They're getting down up there. Oh, it's party time. Lucifer's going. Rejoice, everybody. Sucks for y'all down there on earth. Too bad for y'all. We ain't going to help you up here. Sucks to be you guys. But you got to go through what we went through now. Uh-oh. Ooh, ooh, right. <laughs> that, like, that was literally, literally, legitimately how it played out in my head. Just like, oh, oh, party up here. Sucks for y'all down there though, but hey, we're having a <laughs> we're having a good time up here. Sorry, y'all. You know, but but and, and, and yeah, it's kind of it's silly, and maybe they didn't really necessarily mean it in that sort of way. But my point is that that right there is is the mindset that you may be tempted to have when you're going through that tough time, and those that really should be there, those that you thought would care. Or, 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 you know, should be there to kind of uplift you. It's all, it's like all of a sudden they want to back up a little bit, but they want to watch and enjoy seeing you squirm and go through what you go through. And now it's like it's, it's a, a role reversal, and now they're going through a rough time, and now they're having to see you, uh, you know, stretch your way out of this, you know, this this little egg that you've been in. It's like you didn't you didn't hatched out and you didn't got all out of your your little box there and, and you and you're kicking and you know you, you're getting all amped up again like a little kid jumping up and down on a trampoline going crazy about to fall off and bust their head open but get up and not care and jump back on the, the trampoline again and anyway <laughs> with blood everywhere but they don't care because they're having fun yeah that so <laughs> So they're just they're just having a, a a a good time, or you're just having a good time now, and it's easy for you to have this. Sucks to be you. That's what you get. Uh, now it's on you. Now now we get to see uh, how you deal with it. Man, man, man. Don't do it. Don't don't be. You know. I'm not saying you shouldn't celebrate you having a good time now. I'm just saying that you don't turn around and do the whole, well, it sucks to be y'all, but I'm just going to party over here and, and let y'all watch me party now. That's, that's, that's you know, don't, don't do that. <laughs> so go with me to Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 47. <clears throat> now, real quick. Let me explain what's going on here, which many of us, we know this story. We know how it plays out with Judas. You have Jesus, and he's been doing his ministry thing. He's been traveling here and there and uh, teaching and, and preaching and healing people and delivering people and causing all these miracles. All this great stuff has happened. And we know that there are some people who just don't like Jesus because of what he teaches and they feel like what he has to say is so different from what they want people to believe. So they got it out for Jesus. You've got the Pharisees and some of these scribes and high priests that have the things that they teach. And Jesus has taken things to a whole nother level. He's turned everything upside down from what they're used to. And even though he's there to give them better, they, they feel like what he's doing is just not uh, a part of their agenda. So they want to stop him. Now, many times you see these types of people basically just find opportunities to try to question Jesus, to try to always have something negative to say, but you never really see them uh, many times really try to physically attack Jesus. And there's a reason for it. Matter of fact, somewhere, somewhere in the Gospels, I can't quite remember where, I just thought of this, but there's somewhere in, in the Gospels where... Uh, it was saying that they wanted to lay hands on Jesus. And I'm not talking about the good laying on the hands and praying, of course. <laughs> I mean, they they wanted to lay hands on him and, like, hurt him. But it says that they didn't for fear of the people or for fear of the crowd. In other words, they wanted to, to hurt Jesus, but they were scared of, of the, the general public seeing them come undone and show their true colors. Because the big thing for them was to be so concerned about what people thought of, of them because they had to be so uh, in good standing in the imaginations of the people so that they could continue to teach them what they wanted them to believe. So if they're coming up against somebody who is saying some things that might be different, 
but the people like what what this other person what jesus is saying they got to be careful they so so in other words now they're at a point where they got to try to find a way to stop jesus but they have to be strategic they have to make sure that he's alone somewhere where the general public do, don't see them show their true side and, and really attack jesus and they have to do it during a time where they have enough time to do all these things that they want to do and we know what they do they get him and they take him somewhere in private and they blindfold him and they smack him around and they taunt him and tease him and they put him on trial and they have people uh, uh, just coming out at him, bearing false witness. And then they have him put up to be uh, crucified on the cross and tortured on the cross, the whole nine yards. So this is what happens. This is what they do. They talk to Judas. We know that Judas was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, one of his followers, someone that was close to Jesus. And it was an opportunity for those who were against Jesus to uh, come into agreement with Judas because he was someone that was close to Jesus, that knew any patterns that he might have, any, any habits that he might have. So he would know the perfect time that Jesus would be alone to lead jesus's enemies to him so he just sold out for some silver to uh to basically give them information about jesus to lead them at the right place at the right time to jesus so jesus and a few of his disciples were up praying late into the night and as they wrap things up here comes judas with the whole gang of people that you know we're up against jesus and so starting in verse 47 it says this and while he yet spake behold a multitude and he that was called judas one of the twelve went before them and drew near unto jesus to kiss him now that was the signal judas told him hey follow me and the one that i walk up to and kiss this is jesus because of course they may struggle to kind of see him you know, during, you know, during that dark time at night, he's saying, this is, this is Jesus. And when I kiss him, this is your signal to know that the time is perfect to come and grab a hold of him and take him off. <clears throat> Verse 44, uh, 48 says, but Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? So he's letting Judas know, like he's called him out right there. Like he's letting him know, I, I already know what you're doing. You're doing this not to be friendly to me, but to betray me. 49, when they which were about him saw what will follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. So when the people that have Jesus' back, the few that are there that are supposed to have his back, when they see what's going on, they see what's about to happen. One of them says, hey, you know, do you want us to do something about this, Lord? Can we can we smite him with the sword? And before Jesus can even say anything, one of them takes his sword and cuts off the ear of one of Jesus's enemies that are there to get him. So let's see what it says here. Fifty one. And Jesus answered and said, suffer ye thus far and he touched his ear and healed him jesus decides no let this happen let this play out don't try to stop them because i know it's my time so let them let them do what they came here to do and he reaches out and he heals this man to where his ear is back perfect on his head again as if what just happened didn't even just happen wow <laughs> so my point is jesus if he wanted to instead of being nice and just being like hey let this play out i'm gonna I'm heal this guy he's 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 coming up against me but i'm gonna put his ear back intact it could have played out so different jesus when when listen when that guy's ear got cut off jesus could have just went like sucker you got served right y'all remember those those old dance movies called you got served and it'd be like these different dance teams battling it out 
And it was almost like they were gangs, but instead of like battling their beef out with violence, they just went out in the streets and just like started dancing. And then like the more serious it was, the more they really got down and dirty and was doing all these hardcore break dance moves and stuff. Right then, Jesus could have said some, something similar to how they <laughs> back then would have said, sucker, you got served. And all of a sudden, all this stuff could have started playing out. He could have been like, let there be cardboard, right? Like how God in the beginning was like, let there be light, let there be this, let there be that. He could have been like, let there be cardboard. And all of a sudden, there could have been like a layer of cardboard on the ground in front of everybody. Then he could have said, let there be a stereo. Then then a, a boom box would have appeared. And he could have pressed play to his favorite song. And all of a sudden, Jesus could have just... Right, and then he got down and just started spinning around, and then he could have started spinning around on his head. Then there's somebody in the background, <laughs> right? All of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, they're just like they're just going in, just having this dance battle. Everybody's like, "Go Jesus, go Jesus!" And then all the people that are his enemies that came with Judas, they'd be looking around like, "What is this madness? What is this?" <laughs> what is this dancing that they speak of? We've never heard this music before. This is blasphemy, right? <laughs> this could have played out so different. Jesus could have just went in on everybody. <laughs> it could have been so different. And he could have just had that, oh, you got served attitude. He could have been all nan nan -na boo boo this is what you get. Y'all tried to come at me with all these swords, ready to stab me, ready to take me off, have me crucified, have me pierced in the side. But now y'all are getting y'all's ears cut off. And we're showing y'all up with these dance moves y'all ain't never seen before. That's what you get. Sucks to be y'all right now, right? <laughs> That's how it could have went down. That's how it, I'm just saying. That's what could have happened, but that's not what happened. So I'm just saying. <laughs> so we need to look at this <laughs> more from the perspective of how Jesus would have went about it. Last place I'm going to take you to. I know I'm being a little animated with this with this message, but I just I just felt like it was just perfect for the message. But anyway, Ezekiel chapter 28. <clears throat> I find this interesting. You would think that God the Father would be so upset with Lucifer. Of course, he, he, he was, but you would think he would go about it in a, in a different light than, than what he does. You would think that God would have this uh, nanny boo boo sucks to be you type attitude with Lucifer. You would think that God just absolutely would want to destroy him right off the bat for turning his back on him and causing trouble in heaven and causing trouble here on earth with God's children. But the interesting thing is God still has compassion and still cares. God feels some type of way <laughs> about it, as we would say it today. He feels some type of way <laughs> about this. In Ezekiel 28, we see God give actually a bit of a lamentation for Lucifer, for Satan. And what it is, is it's, it's directed towards this king of a place called Tyrus, but it's a two-in-one thing because even though he's talking to him or about him, he's using what he has to say about Lucifer in, in, in reference to him. So it's a two-in-one thing. He's talking uh, to someone, but, but he's using what he has to say about someone else to this person. So even though he's talking about this person, he's really talking about Lucifer. And it'll make sense, more sense when I read it, but he's given this lamentation, and a lamentation is kind of like, it's kind of like, like maybe a song or like a speech or something along those lines given to show a bit of grief or sorrow. It's like a woe, but like, you know, with, with actual words and stuff. <laughs> it's not just saying woe, it's like, 
you know, let, let me actually go in detail and write this out like it's a poem or a story or something to actually show this woe, to show the actual grief. And it's a, a lamentation is something that can be shared during like, like a funeral, like how we would have a funeral today, because at a funeral, people get together and so you'll have people, you know, they'll be sitting down in the pews, but then somebody will get up and they'll come and stand in front of somebody and they'll, you know, share you know, the, the, the good memories, the good times of the person that's there dead in the casket. And so that's kind of how God is talking about Lucifer. Yeah, he's still alive, but he's talking about him as if really he's dead because technically, well, you know, he is like he's alive, but, but he's dead. He, he doesn't have this chance of eternal life in heaven anymore. So it's as if he's really dead. So he's giving this lamentation. And, and it's pretty crazy, but let's just look at it. Ezekiel 28, verse 11, starting at verse 11, it says this. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So this is what he's saying about Lucifer. He was full of wisdom, which, of course, it's God-given wisdom, and perfect in beauty. So he's a beautiful angel. 13, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, which he was. We, we saw it played out. He was the, the serpent in the garden. Every precious stone was thy covering. So he goes in more, into more detail about his beauty and about all these, these precious jewels that... that uh, Lucifer was covered in it and it says the sardius the topaz and the diamond the beryl the onyx and the jasper the sapphire the emerald and the carbuncle and gold the workmanship of thy tabrets or tambourines and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created so it's like hey even when I created you I created you in such a way and in such a, a, a detail, I knew what I was doing with you. So he's, he, so God's going way back. He's taking it back to when he created him and the details of his creation. So he's lamenting hard about this. He's for real. 14, thou art the anointed cherub. So he's saying, hey, you, you, you know, you're anointed. You're chosen. I chose you. You're, you know, you're special. I had a special task for you. So, what made him special? Look at this. The anointed cherub that covereth. What does that mean, that covereth? Well, what that means basically is this. You had the Ark of the Covenant, and we, we learn more about this in um, Old Testament study where you have the Ark of the Covenant, and it was something that had um, the presence of God in, in the purest form sitting on this. And you had two angels, two special cherubs, who their job was to basically be a covering for God's presence. Because, of course, to fully look on the, the presence of God in its purest, most glorious form, I mean, it, it's just too much. It's too bright and brilliant and amazing in, in brightness and color to, to be able to stand it. So there were two special cherubs, one on one side and one standing on the other side of this ark. And what they did was they had their wings out. So one would be standing facing uh, of the ark on one side and, and would have his wing out like this. And then the other would be standing there and he'd have his wing out like this. And they're both just kind of letting their the feathers from their wings just kind of drape down and cover up some of, of the presence. And basically Lucifer, who we now know as Satan, he was one of those two that did that. So God thought him special enough or made him so special enough that he entrusted in him to do this. So if you think about it, Lucifer, he really had it going on. Like, I mean, the, the fact that he even rebelled against God just blows my mind just because he wanted God's attention and God's worship. He felt like he deserved to be in that position with God. When he really should have just been humble and thankful that he was such a chosen 
vessel for God. It says, and I have set thee so. So he's saying, I did this. In other words, I chose you for this. This isn't something that you necessarily earned. You know, I, Lucifer, I did this for you. So he, he's lamenting hard. He's just like saying, dude, like how, how we would be like, bro, how, how you, how you going to do me like that, bro? <laughs> That's kind of like what he's doing. Like, bro, come on, bro. Like for real. <laughs> Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created. I made you perfect, but even later on down the lines, even with your free will, you were still perfect until iniquity is iniquity was found in thee. You were perfect until you rebelled against me. Mm. by the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned therefore i will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of god and i will destroy thee o covering cherub from the midst of the stones of fire thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty in other words your your heart turned against me you became cold-hearted and went against me just because of your own beauty just because you thought you were just all that in a bag of chips that has corrupted thy wisdom. In other words, you ain't so smart as you, th you thought you once were, by the way. <laughs> you come up against me. Evidently, you're not so bright after all, light bearer. <laughs> oh, goodness. By reason of thy brightness, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled the sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities. By the iniquity of thy traffic, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. So he's saying there's going to be a day where I'm going to completely just end it for you. In other words, you're not here in heaven anymore, but but even your time on the earth is is going to come to an end. And you've got a time limit because because, of course, as I've explained in, in, in sermons past, we're bound by time and space here. But God, he's not bound by, you know, all that stuff like we are. So since he's since Satan's here on earth, he he too when when he's here doing stuff and running amok, he's got time limits on stuff. But God's letting him know your time is running out. And that's what it was saying in Revelations in that last part uh, at the end of chapter or uh, verse 12 when it was saying that Satan knows that he has but a little bit of time left now that he's been cast down to the earth. So God's just letting him know again, you know, your time's running out and there's coming a time where, you know, any type of rulership that you can have, not even in earth anymore, it's all going to be done away with. And when you ponder on that, that's pretty that's pretty crazy that's the god that we serve though it's awesome to know that the god we serve has such a huge heart that the very one one of the very vessels that he created that you would think that god would be able to continue to trust the most and that would have god's back no matter what because you got to know the intimacy that had to be there between god and lucifer for for him to be one of the chosen cherubs to you know, be that covering. I mean, you, you got to know that's heartbreaking for God. Yeah, God knew it was going to happen, but but he allows it because of free will. But still, you know that even though he knew how it was going to play out, he's still like, bruh, come on, you know. <laughs> how are you just going to do that to me, bro? Me, me, God, you know, Senor God. How are you, <laughs> you going to do it to me, S.A., you know? <laughs> But but even though that's that's how he is about it, and he has to let them know again, listen, time's running out, and people are going to see this downfall of yours, he's like, I still remember, I still remember the good of you. I still remember from when I created you, who I created you to be, and you're not being that person. And you don't want to go back to being that person, so I got to let your time run out. You can't, you know, live on. You don't have a space up here in heaven anymore for you. But for the record, I still remember those good times. 
he still doesn't have that, oh, it sucks to be you, <laughs> attitude. And with him being God's ultimate enemy, you would, you would think that God could do that. He would have the right to do so, but even he doesn't. Something to think about. When, when the, the, the ultimate enemy of God is someone that God gives like an early funeral for, if you will, given his lamentation. So with that said, whoever may be needing this, I'll just say again, don't have the, oh, sucks to be you, now that, that you see how it feels kind of attitude. You, you got out of your war, now they're in their little war, going through what they're going through. Don't laugh at their tears. Don't point at them when they slip and fall. Don't feel good about the fact that their feelings may be hurt. Continue to be a Christian. Continue to be Christ-like and continue to be God-minded. In other words, be happy, rejoice, celebrate, but celebrate your, your goodness. Celebrate you coming out of the depression, but don't celebrate their bad just give lamentation. I pray us out of here. Heavenly Father, I thank you for another time to minister another word. I pray that anyone that may be needing this message, that they would receive it. And I pray that their heart will be open to fully receive this because there will be some people that may feel like, like they deserve to be able to gloat and to, and to brag and to point fingers and to mock people and to tease when they know that someone else may be going through the hurts now that they were once in. It may make them feel good or it'll feel good to their flesh, but it is not spiritually pleasing to you, Lord. And so let us, Lord, be reminded of your goodness. Let us be reminded of how much you love and how much you forgive and how much you always have grace and new mercy for us every day, every morning we get up. And let us have that same grace, mercy, and compassion to others. We can have that same grace and mercy without also going back to being someone's doormat and letting them step all over us and treat us any kind of way. Lord, I give you all the praise, the glory, and honor. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.